for complete procedures or to block future calls, dial 1 86. Hello? Hello, Jackie. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine. Is this Vernon? Yes, it is. How are you doing? How are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing just great. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for calling. Okay. All right, so, you know, you're in the Vibing with Don Vito show, um, and this is the show where I get your story and I give you uh, the opportunity to tell your side of the story and, uh, you know, your case and stuff like that and the turn of events and, you know, things in that nature. Okay. All right, I, so, um, uh, I think... Go ahead. Is that what you were going to say? Oh, no, I... I... She, um, April uh, kind of schooled me in on some of it. Yes. So, um, can you tell everybody your name and where you come from? Oh, okay. My name is Jacqueline Alexander, but they call me Jackie. Um, I was born in Charlotte, North Carolina. Okay. And uh, how was life growing up in Charlotte, North Carolina as a young girl? Um, well, growing up, I, my life was, uh, kind of rough. Um, it's very violent growing up, um, and watching things in front of me. Um, I, that's all I, I, I ever known was violence because, um, there's a lot of fighting, a lot of, um, a lot of cursing and, um, and we got a lot of beatings for things we didn't know what we were getting beating for. That's my siblings and I. I was, I'm the oldest. And um, so life was kind of violent. My mom's boyfriend or my sister's dad or whatever, they always was beating on her. So that's where the violence come in at. I, I witnessed that firsthand with them beating on my mom growing up. So as life went on, when um, she kept getting beat, I kept jumping in it, you know, trying to take up for her as a little girl. But, um, I mean, not that they could do anything. Several times my sister's dad tried to kill her. And um, I think had I not been there, it would, he would have been successful. But, um, but then as, as I started growing, you know, I became very violent, and, and I became the abusey instead of um, the abuser. I mean, you know, I became the one to do the abusing. And um, there was a lot of alcohol, and then in my lifetime, I was I was a, a very I started drinking at a very young age. Forced, not by choice. I was forced to drink it, and um, I, my grandfather made me drink it when I was 12 years old, and that's when he started molesting me. And um, so I became an alcoholic, and, and when I got older, and I, I relied on it. I, I couldn't live without it, so I thought. And I, um, I, I stayed in a lot of trouble because I just couldn't wrap my mind around my mom dying at 28 when I was 12 years old. And then I couldn't wrap my mind around us moving with my grandfather thinking it was the best thing. And then he started molesting us, and I couldn't wrap my mind around that. So I, I I couldn't cope. I couldn't cope, and, and there was no one to seek help for me because I was so mean. No one wanted to be bothered with me pretty much. And um, so I started the alcohol, and, and it went from there to the drugs. And um, I, I very seldom held down a job. Most of the time I was either selling drugs or I had someone to, to, you know, provide for us, you know, a man to provide for us or whatever. And it was pretty rough.
It was pretty rough. And I think I'm kind of like cleaning it up, but it wasn't really that clean. Mm. So you said your grandfather molested you? Yes. At what age yes. did that start? Twelve years old. Was your grandmother alive at the time? No, he was married to this lady who, um, she's no kin to us. He, he married her. Um, she had a son. And, um, back then we didn't have bathrooms in that house. We moved from Kannapolis, from Charlotte to Kannapolis when my mom died at 12. Well, I was 12 years old. And so we was living in Kannapolis, and they didn't have, we didn't have bathrooms in our house. So that was one of the things his wife was really, she was kind of like the wicked grandmother, the wicked step-grandmother. Um, she would get mad at us if um, we didn't, like we had this whole flop job. And my brother was the one to take it out all the time and not her son. And so I had something to say about that. And I, my mouth was too sassy. And um, so she and I did not see eye to eye. And um, and several times we got into it. Um, I was coming and singing the great song of the, the prayer for you eat. God is great, God is good. And she told me not to, not to sing it to say, so far hung. And she hit me, so I took the plate of grits and hit her in the chest. And so it started from there. Um, so how it was angry at me. My mom just died. We had to move in with these people, um, my grandfather, them, and her. And um, she thinks she's our mom or whatever. And um, we got to do this. We got to clean up. We got to do all the cleaning. And her son does nothing. And we shook her to cook a pot of beans at the first of the week and expect us to eat it all week while she and her son eat chicken boxes and stuff like that. And we could, wasn't allowed to go into the refrigerator. So when the, the thing with her and her son and my brother got into it about just taking this, this jar out, then we finally got a bathroom. Then she was saying that the bathroom would smell like pee. So she had locked the bathroom when my sister and brothers and I, we couldn't go to it. So we still had to go use the owl house and use other people's toilets. And um, they would pump us with cat, cat oil to... You know, if we cough, <laughs> just so you got a cold. So we got to take this stuff, and we have no bathroom to use because she's locked the bathroom. And um, she would call my sister all kinds of names, and then I get mad, and so now I'm ready to fight her. And I mean, she she was just really, really wicked, and she was doing she was spending my granddaddy's money. His bootlegger had pool hall, and you know, and she was spend his money and tell him that, you know, we stole the money. And we're like sleeping at 3 o'clock in the morning. We got this big, big strap coming across, and we don't know what we've done. And it, it was constantly like that. I mean, practically every week. It, it was bad. And um, we say something out of the way, and uh, her son go back and tell a lie, and they believe it. They believe it. And we were, we were, we were like... Um, the baby kids, you know, and we were bad. We were saying every every name you could possibly think. Mm. So, um, how long did this go on? All the way until uh, I ran away from home. Um, we couldn't tell nobody because we were scared. Um, because I see him shoot a man in his pool hall, and he, he they didn't do anything to him, the police or anybody, you know. So, and he had said, if, you know, if I was to ever say anything, he would kill me. So I actually believed it. So I was scared. And um, so it went on. I was 12, and I ran away from home when I was, like, um, 15. I ran away home when I was, like, 15, almost 16. And, um... That's when he and I really got into it because he didn't want to give me my um my my permit. Then when I had got my driver's license, he took that. And he told uh, the people down there that I was a a reckless driver, and and so they wouldn't let me have my license or anything like that. And then it was my um 
my next to the, I'm, I'm the oldest since my brother and it's my sister, it's five of us. But my next to the oldest sister, he started molesting her. And, you know, I ran away and he tried to make me come back. And so when I did come back, I had to come back because I was still under eight. So I had to go back. And so when I turned 18, I went and got married just to get out of the house. It wasn't for love. It was just to get out of the house, just to keep from having to live there. And um, or, and thinking I was in love, just, just whatever the case may be, I was just ready to get out of there, however I had to get out of there. And they went home from, from 12 to about practically 18. All right, so you got married, and then um, where did you live at? St. Town? St. Town, yes. Kannapolis. All right, so when you got married, did life change for you for the better? Um, no. <laughs> I'm sorry, Vernon, and this thing is so sensitive. I bent over to get tissue, and it cut off on me. No, that's all right. You know, it happens sometimes. I'm glad you called back. I'm glad you called back. Yes. So I had asked you the question, would the thing get better when you um, when you move? No, it didn't because my husband was on drugs and I didn't know that he was on drugs. I didn't know that he was doing drugs. I I I only know of drugs from the things at school, but um he I would find packages, little clear bags, corners and he would tell me some made up story and I would believe him because I didn't know he was doing drugs. And so one of his parties we started fighting and you know, and the bill collectors kept coming around and he kept saying, Tell him I'm not here, you know, and I'm working and he's working and kids and no the more what the bills were, we were making the money to to do it. And he had a good job and I had a good job and I couldn't understand and because I knew he was doing drugs and so they, he was one of his partners told me, and it, it, it got really ugly from there because um, when the bill collector would come and they wanted his car and stuff, I told him where it was. I told him, yes, he's in here, you know. And um, so I talked to his brother-in-law. His brother-in-law was trying to help me, and um, his brother, my brother-in-law, was trying to help me. And so I put him out, and... Um, then it got really, really crazy. He stepped, he kept coming for me, wanting to fight me in public and that sort of thing. And um, with my mindset, my mind was like, oh, I'll go from one to a thousand in, in the, before the dime can hit the floor. And so when he comes for me, I just go for what I know. I go for whatever I can get my hands on. And so I just cut him up real bad one time because I didn't know if he's going to hurt me. Or, you know, I just didn't have the right kind of mindset. Uh, it was the face Jackie. That's my mindset. Get them before they get you. And and so I I did. I cut him up real bad. And I think after that note there, he finally left me alone. And um, uh, so I I kept hanging around people who was drinking and tooting powder, and I ended up trying it. And one thing led to another. So life didn't get no better. It didn't get no better. It just went downhill from there. Um, everything did. And then with my attitude and the way I acted and as mean as I was and hateful as I was, no one wanted to step in and tell me you, you're making a mistake or whatever. Nobody even attempted to try. And so okay, it went so downhill. Everything went downhill at that point. Yes. Yeah. So let me ask, let me ask you a question. So, um, how much time? How long have you been incarcerated? Um, I'm coming up on 23 years now. It's going to be 23 years. And how old are you now? Uh, today I turned 59. Today. Oh wow! Happy birthday! Happy birthday! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, happy birthday to you. Okay. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. <laughs>
So, um, did you guys stay together or did you split up after the, after the violence and stuff? Oh, no, we, we split up. After I cut him up real bad, he, um, he left me alone. And, um, so from then on out, all my affairs, all, all my relationships, um, it's pretty much, I, I never had violent relationships. I had pretty nice, decent guys. I just didn't know how to treat them because I never, I never thought um, I deserved anything good, I guess. I never thought I was worried of anything good because I've always been bad. And when I did have the good stuff, I didn't know how to, to act. I didn't know how to accept it. I didn't know how to treat them, you know, or anything like that. And um, so that was a whole new ball game for me, and I didn't know how to play the game. I didn't know how to, to treat them. So I just I just would do things just to see if I could get a, a row out of them, see if I could make them angry enough to want to fight, you know, just, just stupid stuff I would do. And they didn't want to fight. They didn't want to put their hands on me. They wasn't raised like that or whatever. But I wanted to see. And I kept pushing them and pushing them and pushing them. So I pushed them away. Let me ask you a question. So um, what are you incarcerated for? Um, murder. And how did that take place? Well, I have this, he was my friend, my best friend, Thomas was, and um, we had been friends for, gosh, 20 years or so, and um, and when I get into it, like with my boyfriend and don't want to stay home, I go stay with Thomas, and he always kept uh, a roof over my head. He always had a place for me, and he, me and my, my two kids, Chunk and Mark. I got three, but at the time it was two. And he always made room for me. And uh, so as time went on, I just ended up staying there with him. And he, he, he was like, just like family, you know. But, um, and he was, a, he was an overall good guy. And uh, so a lot of times um, I knew Thomas liked me, but he was a shy guy. I guess you, um, the only way I can describe our relationship, his and ours, is like Forrest Gump with Jenny. That's the only way I can describe our, our, our relationship with him. He was not my type. He was a quiet, nerdy type guy. And um, he would do whatever I say do. And, I mean, and, and he, he was, but he never pushed himself on me or never tried to advance on me or anything like that. Um, but... He he was he was just always there. He was always there. He was always there when I got in trouble because he got me. He was always there with a roof over my head for me. And so he would uh, sometimes get a fear in my relationships with guys and he you know, tell them a lie or tell them I went somewhere with this person, which that was the truth But at the time. But it, like I told him, he had no business. So we'll fall out over that, over him meddling. And um, at this particular time, so much is going on in my life that um, I, I think I was just at a breaking point. So much is going on. Um, there's a lot going on there. I wanted to um, – I had this back and forth. I had just got this job at Philip Morris, and I wanted to keep it. It was a third shift job. And I was back and forth, back and forth to court for a whole week working third shift and then going to court. And then my kids was at home. They didn't want to work. They was up age, not trying to work. One was, one wasn't. One didn't want to go to school. So I was battling out with them. And then I was fighting, trying to come off the drugs. I didn't want to do the drugs anymore. So I had a lot going on there. And so um, my boyfriend at the time, I told him that I wanted to go to church and get my, get my life to Christ and just end this stuff. I'm tired. So he was like, well, wait till I'm off, and we'll go when I'm off. So, But that weekend, I always kept children. I've had kids all my life on the weekends. But this particular weekend, I didn't have no kids. 
So it was my sister's birthday, June the 12th, and um, my daughter was all right. I was keeping kids. So I was like, why are you over there keeping the kids? Why are they over here? And so, so my, my niece, like my co-defendant that was involved in this murder. So I asked Thomas to take me over. That's the one that died, the victim. I asked him to take me to, to, to pick her up. And he was like, I'm not going to. We were stressing about it. He didn't like my son and my daughter's friends because they were, you know, little thugs. He didn't like he didn't like them, and um, so we got a little argument there. And but he only took me, and we come back, and the argument started back up, and I just ignored him, and I, I picked up some dope on my way out. And so later on that night, I come text me, take you know, take Shauna home, and that's when we started arguing, and we started uh, the argument led to me hitting him. And when I hit Thomas, he hit me back, and he has never, ever hit me back. And it kind of stunned me. It kind of shocked me. And we started fighting. He, he had slammed me on the floor, so I grabbed these little scissors. They're just little scissors that kids play with. It, it, it's that cut, that little paper dolls out, something like that. And I grabbed the scissors, and I started stabbing him and um, uh, in the chest, trying to get him off of me. And that's when Derek, my co-defendant, came in, and... He was pulling him off of me. My niece stayed out in, outside in the yard, and um, he came in, and so things got crazy, and we started, all three of us fighting, and um, Derek, Thomas was on top of me. He ended up back on top. Derek went in the uh, kitchen and got a fire, and he hit him upside the head with the frying pan. And that's when I saw Thomas' eyes rolling in the back of his head. And um, and eventually he ended up dying, and we tried to um, cover up the body by burning it and leaving it in the trunk of the car burning. And um, they came back to the house that morning because that's where they lived. And um, so, and then went from there. We went to jail that day, that morning. And. Um, my co-defendant told him that I did everything, and I I hit him and all this in the head and everything, and everything was put on me. And then they kind of, the, the, the system kind of put it on me, too, because they said I was the, the adult. Derek was 16 at the time. And I was like, it doesn't matter. He's a thug. But it didn't matter. They they I already had a record anyhow, so... They didn't want to hear anything I had to say, so I was the victim again, but which I was wrong with my part I played in it, and I um, tried to write a letter. I wrote the letter trying to get it to his people and tell them my part in it. I, I was wrong for what I did, and um, but they they never. I never heard back from them, but. Um, we did a documentary, of, uh, I think it's like in August of 2008, if I'm not mistaken, and I saw Derek's part, and he pretty much blamed everything on me, and I was like, oh, okay, nothing I can do about it, nothing I can do about it. So you said he did a documentary? I did in 2008. I think it's okay. in 2008. And who was you with? Huh? Who did I do it with? documentary for you, yes. Um, the We, We People, the We Production? Yes, yes. So, um, when you went to court, did you have, um, did you go to trial or did you take a plea? What happened? I went to trial. Because I'm like, I didn't kill him. I only had a hand in there, and I know you assess this this is bad, but um, they, I don't know, my child was crazy because I only had 10 months to prepare. I went to jail June the 14th, uh, 1998, and uh, April the 14th, 1999. 
I was patient. Everything was done quickly. In 10 months with a capital murder case. And um, so our heads were spinning and nobody knew what was going on. And they never would change, you know, the venue. And it, it was a little town. And um, so in court, in court, um, I mean, they threw up my, my past. Um, they said stuff that happened at the crime that um, they said I did, which I didn't. And the things I did do, I told him I did. Um, so I couldn't, I just couldn't see me being charged with murder. Um, but uh, accessory, yes. Helping, yes. But I had to take it, take the rap, and it was okay because there wasn't anything I could do about it at the time. And they said it was going to do appeal. And I told my attorney, I had two attorneys, and I told the one everything because that one, he never even heard anything that happened. It was like, uh, the skits is over with, basically. He never even listened to anything that I had to say or tell him what had happened. But, um, yep. He ended up charging me for a first degree murder. And I was facing life or the death penalty. You said you were facing, facing life or the death penalty? Or death. Yes, it was up to the jury. And they gave you life. Life without parole, yes. How much total time did they give you? Life without parole, and uh, like two weeks before my trial, they came and served me a, a, a robbery charge. Um, they said I robbed him. Um, which I didn't. That was Derek that did it, but he told him I did. Um, I don't know how it came about two weeks before after being in there 10 months, but um, they came and, and my lawyer told me they got to have a motive. They got to find a motive for, for, for to blame murder on. They got to have a motive, and that's their motive. So anyhow, they brought that up there, so I got, I want to say 17, like, Close to 17 years, life plus 17, and they gave me like 19 months for burning of the body because I did light the lighter. Like I told him, he poured the gas, I lit, I lit the lighter. You know, I lit it. So um, that's what I got. So you guys burned the body in the trunk of the car? Yes. And yes. You, did you hide the car or how did they find the car? No, we left it on the bridge, scared, walked back to the house, tried to clean up the mess, and it was like, you know, it was like blood everywhere, and uh, it was kind of um, kind of hard to clean it up, you know? Yeah. How much time did your 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 co defendant get being that he uh he put everything on you? Um, he got something at twenty five years, so he did like nineteen. He did like nineteen, he's out. Wow. Do you guys communicate at all? No. Uh my daughter seen him a couple of times in the stores or whatever, and um, he tried to avoid her, but one incident, she made him speak or whatever, I told just let it go, just let it go, you know, because uh, at, the the, at the end of the day, it's all in God's hand, everything is, it's just, the work done is done, and all to do is make it make things better, it's been worse, so don't, don't make him speak. So, um, so, since you've been in, incarcerated, what have you done with, um, with this time while you've been in jail? Oh, gosh, everything. Um, I've taken a lot of classes, a lot of self-help classes. I even went to mental health um, because back in the day, 
they uh, used to tell us mental health was for crazy people, so I always thought that I ain't going on mental health. But I went, um, one of the social workers picked me out, and um, she made me go, she said, I need it, and I did it. And so I, I was able to deal with the things that was, you know, they had, they had a hold of my life, and I couldn't let go of. And uh, one of them was the molestation of my grandfather, and my mother's dying, and uh, the abandonment. Nobody still there for me. So um, I was able to deal with that, and I did. Um, I I started my AA degree. So I went to Troy. I took a bunch of uh, computer classes, and um, I got. Like 11 more classes for my AA, and I've taken um, all the cook school classes. Uh, I've been the Cairo director. Um, I've been the president of Women's Service Club. Um, I've been um, like the role model inmate. Um, um, play sports. I've been the coach of all of it. Uh, Bible studies and dance team choir. Uh, and, uh, pretty much I've been in all the self help groups, classes they've had. Got a slew of certificates uh, on my job. I'm on now, I'm on an uh, apprenticeship now for the enterprise uh, where I work. So, uh, I mean, I've, I've done a lot. Done a lot. Got a lot of lot. Got a lot, but it sounds to me like you uh you matured and you turned your life around. Yes, yes. I have. Um I don't know, I, I would say that I was like I had read something one time and it was something about when you've been molested or raped, uh your life story got already been told, but I guess it's all the choices you make, and I, I, I could have straightened it up. I could have done better, but I didn't. But a lot of times I was, um, I, I mean, I just had the pain. I just had so much pain and so much hurt from my mom dying with five kids, and, um, and then I didn't have a good experience with God because my mom when she was sick, this pastor making all this stuff up, selling it to her for a lot of money. And um, he swept down, he was, you know, the healer. And my mom was dying, and he made a move in his house and was taking her money. And he didn't like me. He didn't want me to touch her or anything. So he, they, we would sit in church all day. All day. So I, I really was really angry with God, and I didn't want to have anything to do with God. But my pastor now, he came to me. And he he just he he went through everything and he saw what I needed and he um he said she needs to be loved she's never felt love and I I had and I just thought love was violent because that's the way it was you know like, that's what it was shown to me and so uh, he came and he just 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 showed me love and he was just there for me through the good and the bad and the ugly him and his wife and um so yeah, I I accepted Jesus and I um uh, my life has been a turnaround. Um well I used to hate I don't hate people anymore. I don't wanna fight people anymore. I don't wanna hurt people anymore. I don't I don't like that stuff anymore. That that I was, that is what I'm so totally against, and I just hate seeing it in the young girls now. And it, it just breaks my heart, and I just have to look at them saying I was just like that, and I just have to thank God for a change. And I, I would never go back to that life ever, ever, ever again. That's good. That's, um, that shows growth, and God is everything. God is everything, yes. like you said. Yes, he has. Nobody can judge you. Only God can judge you, no matter what you do. That's right. Always That's remember right. that. That's right. Always remember that. Everybody has done something wrong. You know, some some That's done right. more than others, but we, we all we're all sinners. We're born in the sin, and the only one can judge us at the That's end right. of the day is God. 
So you keep living your life That's and right. you keep your head up. And, and everything will be I all will. right. No matter if you're in jail, no matter if you're in society. As long as you got God in your life, you're going to be all right. I will. I will. But I think um, we have a um, we have this, this bill they passed, uh, Vernon, and if you were sentenced on October the 1st, 94 to October the 1st, 98, it's like in North Carolina, it's like 200 of us that fit that bill. And it's coming up on 25 years. And I'm I'm in that bill. So they're like considering letting us out in twenty five years. Um, like a commutation or a clemency. Mm-hmm. Um, they're considering us because it depends on how you I, I guess your attention is gonna matter, how you how you passion, how you done in your uh sentence, you know, the things you've done and all that. So that is gonna matter. Um, so I have an attorney and everything, so um, my 2023 be my 25 years. So okay. they're looking at, and it's like nine women, maybe nine or ten of us women that get that, that deal. So we're looking to see what happens. I definitely wish you the best of luck on that. And um, Oh, thank you, thank you. This interview right here. Would definitely help because people get to hear your side of the story opposed to what they read in the newspapers and stuff like that. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Well, also, I would like to. I just have some. Now, go ahead, finish. Oh, I was just saying, I just have so much I want to get back to uh, society. Uh, one of my best friends is like a sister of mine. When I do get out, first thing I'm doing, it's not like, oh, you know how people get out. I got to get myself together first. You know, we already say, when I get out, be it that morning I leave, 12 o'clock, don't take long to get home. So going somewhere, and she said, you finna give me a, you finna give me a, you finna speak to some people somewhere. So we got a lot of them things, a lot of them um, engagements set up for uh, when I do get out and, um, that's one of the things I want to do is try to help those that, that may feel like you're not loved or, or it's not a way out of being molested by someone you love and trusted and, and that there is a better way and to let them know that there's a better way. So that's one of the things I want to do is to help them give back to my community. And that's so, a very good thing. It's a very good thing that you're thinking about doing giving back and sharing your story yeah, so you can save someone else's life who might be thinking of going down the wrong Yeah, I'm going to hit the ground. I'm going to hit the tree where I'm running. I'm not going to wait. Like, wait till tomorrow. No, we're going to do it that day. Like she said, we're going to get busy that day. And we are. Boom, it starts me. So, All right, Jackie. looking forward to. So, uh, can, you, can you give me a follow-up call on Tuesday around 3 p.m.? 3 p.m. Tuesday? Yes. Now, if I have an appointment coming up, if I suppose it's going out, I don't know if it's going to be, what day it's going to be, but if it's not on Tuesday, I will. But if I go out on Tuesday, what's another good day in case oh, I'm, I go out on Thursday, Tuesday? Thursday. Okay. Tuesday would be at 3, and Thursday, if I go out, 3? Yes, yeah, same time. Okay. Oh, what, what time All can right. you call? I what time think... can you call on Tuesday? What time can you call? Uh, Any time after eight o'clock in the morning when they give us our tablets. All right. So how about you call me one o'clock? How about one o'clock? Okay, one o'clock is fine. You call me one o'clock on on Tuesday, and and we'll talk. We'll talk more. All right. All right. All right. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. <sighs> yeah. Thank you for coming to the vibe with you. We have 60 show. seconds remaining. And on Tuesday, oh, we'll see you next time. Right. Right on time. All right. Thank you, Vernon. Once you again, have happy a good day. Birthday. Happy birthday, Jackie. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> have and a I'll good talk day. To you, next week. you too. All right. Okay, Tuesday, bye-bye, one. Okay. Have a good one. Bye bye.